And in today's one-on-one -on -one interview, we talk with Dr. Richard Fury, who is Chief of Rheumatology at Northwell Health in New York. Dr. Fury is the lead investigator on a study on lupus nephritis just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Fury and his colleagues reports that belimumab with standard therapy has been shown to be an effective treatment for people with lupus nephritis. If the treatment is approved, it would be the first of its kind for this condition, which can, which can progress to end-stage kidney disease in as many as 30% of patients. In this presentation, Dr. Fury tells us more. First of all, it was the largest study ever done in lupus nephritis. And uh, what was also remarkable is that it worked. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out, we don't really have approved drugs for lupus nephritis, and it may be worth talking a little bit about the history, the history there. Mm -hmm. We need to go back actually to around 1950. The outlook for patients with lupus, and especially lupus nephritis, was not good. The seven-year survival was about 50%. And then along came steroids, and after that, immunosuppressives and cytotoxics, and we started to do better. However, we've plateaued over the last couple of decades, and unfortunately, we're still losing almost 20% of our patients over a 15-year period. And I can tell you from personal experience, I've had countless number of patients go into renal failure and require dialysis uh, or kidney transplant. So I would say the major unmet need in lupus actually remains lupus nephritis. Now, as far as what percentage uh, get lupus nephritis, you'll get different answers depending uh, who you're asking, and that's dependent upon where they're based. But the numbers range from around 40% uh, up as high as 70% in some cohorts. So it is the most serious uh, and common complication that arises in lupus. Now, as far as therapies, uh, going back maybe 20, 25 years ago, the standard of care for lupus nephritis, and there are different kinds of lupus nephritis. What we're talking about uh, as far as the types that cause the most serious uh, complications are the proliferative nephritides. So focal proliferative nephritis and diffuse proliferative nephritis. And uh, they are typically treated with high doses of steroids and they were typically treated with cyclophosphamide. And there are two different regimens of cyclophosphamide. I'm not gonna go into the details there. But then along came a drug called mycophenolate. And we thought mycophenolate would be the answer for lupus nephritis because it was a pill and we thought it would be far safer than cyclophosphamide. And in fact, many studies were done showing that it was equivalent to cyclophosphamide in its effects, and it did seem to be safer. So in the current era, we generally move to mycophenolate as our first choice, but some physicians are still using cyclophosphamide. But despite what is state of the art, we're only seeing response rates that are about 30% when we talk about the best response, a complete response. So we'll stratify responses, especially in clinical trials, as a complete response, a partial response, or non-response. And it's so important to try to achieve a complete response because it's those patients who achieve a complete response that do best long-term. And I don't know how much we want to get into the definitions of complete response, but complete response is primarily driven by a reduction in proteinuria, but with preservation of kidney function. So complete response of 30, 35% maximum is not good. That means the majority of patients are not having a good response. Therefore, you can see there's a great unmet need for lupus nephritis. To achieve that unmet need, we've done a lot of studies over the last, oh boy, 25 years actually. And the studies are pretty much all designed the same way as add-on designs. And what I mean by that is the experimental therapy is added on to background standard of care. And as mentioned, background standard of care is steroid and mycophenolate, 
And actually there have been, a, a, there was one other study where one could use cyclophosphamide as background. None of the studies prior to this one were successful. But this year we saw a couple of successes and we'll certainly go into detail about belimumab, but there was another study with a different drug called voclosporin in phase three and they had success. And there was also a very successful phase two study with a drug called obinutuzumab, a different mechanism of action. All right, so let's get back to the Bliss LN study. The reason to do Bliss LN was obvious because of the unmet need. The drug, belibumab, had been approved actually in 2011, but it was approved for systemic lupus, extra renal lupus. Patients with very active kidney disease with proliferative nephritis were excluded from those studies leading to belibumab's approval. So we really didn't know how this drug would work in patients with active kidney disease. But we had some hints, and we had some hints from translational science, which suggested that there are elevated levels of BLIS or BAF. BLIS stands for B lymphocyte stimulator in patients with lupus nephritis. But more significantly, there was a post hoc analysis of the combined phase three trials. The two phase three trials that led to the approval of belimumab for SLE had over 1,600 patients. And though we excluded patients with active kidney disease, there were some patients who got in with sort of low level kidney disease. And that actually was about 15% of the cohort. And in looking at response rates, as far as the kidney is concerned in those 15%, there were positive signals. So that also served as impetus to go ahead and do a, a traditional lupus nephritis trial. This trial was unique in several ways. It allowed for two different background therapies, either mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. And that was up to the investigator, so it was not part of the randomization. Patients also received steroids, and they either received belimumab at 10 milligrams per kilogram, and that was the approved dose that was approved back in 2011 or they got a placebo. And the drug was given every four weeks and the study lasted for two years. And we had several different endpoints. Let me show you the there schematic there? of the trial design. The patients who entered were lupus patients who had active kidney disease and that was proven by a kidney biopsy. They had to have either focal proliferative nephritis or diffuse proliferative nephritis and somewhat unique to this particular study is that patients with pure membranous nephritis were allowed to enter. And the randomization occurred uh, one to one, belimumab 10 milligrams per kilogram versus placebo. But again, there was background therapy that consisted of either cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate. But the clear majority received mycophenolate. The stratification was actually by induction and also by race. All right, so this study went for two years and the primary endpoint was at week 104 and it was called PER, P-E-R-R, -R, which is primary efficacy renal of renal response. And it is a composite that's driven by a reduction in proteinuria with maintenance of kidney function. I'll show you that in just a, in a second. And there were some key secondary endpoints also at week 104, the complete renal response, the time to renal related event or death, and the or ordinal renal response. Another secondary endpoint was at week 52, which was the PER, but at an earlier time point. And what was required to be a responder was a reduction in steroids to a dose of prednisone that was 10 milligrams per day or less. And I should, I should also point out that in order to be a responder, the endpoint had to be achieved at consecutive visits. And this was to eliminate some of the laboratory noise that we deal with in clinical trials. <clears throat> 
All right, so for some definitions of the endpoints. PER was defined as the urinary protein creatinine ratio reduction to 0 0.7 or less. That's rather typical for a lupus nephritis trial. That is the endpoint being driven by a reduction in proteinuria. Sometimes we'll pick 0 0.5, sometimes a little bit higher. But the reason for picking those values is that there are data showing that patients who achieve that value in, within one year are those who have much better long-term prognoses. Uh, a second component of this endpoint was that the estimated GFR could be no worse than 20% below the pre-flare value, or if that was not known, it had to be 60, millimeter, uh, 60 mLs per minute or greater. And the patient obviously could not be a treatment failure. So that was the primary endpoint. A, a key secondary was the complete renal response, also at week 104. And that was defined in a, a more rigorous fashion. The urinary protein creatinine ratio had to go down to less than 0 0.5, and the estimated GFR could be no worse than 10% below the pre flare value, or it had to be greater than 90 mLs per minute. Uh, there was another key secondary, the PER at week 52. And then time to renal related event or death is a very interesting uh, metric. It basically gave us a handle on durability and on maintenance of response. Renal related event was consisted of four different things. Uh, patients could not have a doubling of serum creatinine. They could not go into end stage kidney disease and they could not have renal worsening, which was defined two ways, by proteinuria and also by impaired renal function. And they couldn't be a treatment failure. So this is kind of like real life endpoints. That is, you try to keep your patients from achieving some of these endpoints. And then lastly is the ordinal renal response which basically consisted of complete and partial response with two points assigned to complete, one point assigned to partial, and actually zero points to no response. Here are the results. Again, it was the largest lupus nephritis trial ever done with 448 patients randomized. Uh, baseline characteristics are fairly typical of a lupus nephritis trial. You can focus on the renal biopsy class. About 60% had class three or class four, that is focal or diffuse proliferative. All right, so this was the largest uh, lupus nephritis trial ever done, 448 patients randomized. And baseline characteristics were rather typical of a lupus nephritis trial. And we can focus on the renal biopsy class with class three or four accounting for the clear majority of patients but there were about 25% of patients who had coexistent proliferative and membranous nephropathy, and then about 16% had pure membranous nephropathy. And here are the top line results. Placebo column is in gray, the bulimumab column in orange, and you see an effect size of about 11 percentage points providing a p-value of 0 0.03. And actually the effect sizes were pretty much the same for the key secondaries. So complete renal response had an effect size of a little over 10 percentage points and the PER and week 52 as well. Time to re renal related event had a different output. It was a hazard ratio showing about a 50% reduction in the attainment of that particular outcome. And then for the ordinal renal response at two years, you can see those results being statistically significant. All right, so uh, more results to show you. We have kinetics of the primary outcome measure, the PER, and you can see early separation, actually as early as week 24, which is uh, very, gratifying to see for bulimumab. And that separation is maintained until week 104. 
The display on the right, I think, is even more compelling. This is the time to achievement of the primary endpoint, but maintained through steady end. And you see um, a hazard ratio of close to 1.5. So a nice separation occurring somewhat early. And a similar analysis on the next slide showing complete renal response. Same, basically, uh, type of kinetics. An early response as early as uh, week 24 to week 36, somewhere in there. And time to complete renal response maintained to the study end also has a very impressive hazard ratio of close to 1.6. Time to renal re related event. And that's where it's spending just a little bit of time on. Again, that was a composite. And I think it speaks to durability and the ability of, of the drug to maintain a response and prevent worsening. You can see in the table in the right, renal worsening favored, or lack, I should say, of renal worsening favored belimumab. Uh, lack of treatment failure favored belimumab. The doubling of serum creatinine, the progression to end-stage kidney disease and death were infrequent events. But if you look at the left-hand side of the slide now, uh, the probability of experiencing a renal-related event or death is, is displayed. And you see clear separation with also, again, a hazard ratio that I mentioned before of 0 0.5. So basically a 50% reduction in the attainment of this particular metric. Mm -hmm. And as far as safety, bulimumab is known to have a good safety record. That's been shown in studies over the last 20 years. And I think this supports that as well. Uh, we, there were no new signals compared to other bulimumab trials, or for that matter, compared to other lupus nephritis trials. So where do we stand right now? Well, as you know, the article just came out and uh, it may be a historical event because it is the first study to be published that was successful in lupus nephritis. And I think the next key step is what the regulatory authorities, specifically the FDA, uh, will tell us about extending the label of bulimumab to include patients with lupus nephritis. So the next major event is how the FDA rules on extending the label of bulimumab. Remember, it it's, was approved in 2011 for SLE. And I would think that the FDA will give it a thumbs up for its use in lupus nephritis. And that thumbs up may occur within the next six months. Uh, lupus compared to our sister diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, uh, we've not done uh, as good a job in getting drugs approved as they have. I mean, in rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, I might have lost count, but uh, if you watch television enough, you see the ads. Mm -hmm. But there's probably around 12 to 15 drugs that have been approved for those diseases. Mm -hmm. Lupus has been a real tough nut to crack. Why is that? Well, there, I mean, I could go on for an hour about that, but uh, there's incredible heterogeneity clinical heterogeneity, there's a lot of uh, molecular heterogeneity, uh, the background therapies that patients are on confound interpretation of, of study results, and the list goes on and on. But we are starting to break the ice. Actually, bulimumab broke the ice in 2011, and we're starting to see more and more positive studies. So I think it's just a matter of time before we have more and more drugs approved for our lupus patients, and that will translate into better outcomes because they are sorely needed for our patients. Okay. Look